That was one really long hike. I've been doing it all summer. I'm just glad to be back. So, no, honestly, thank you guys. It's been uh, just an awesome summer for, and uh, the sabbatical was amazing for just not only me and and my family, but just seeing what you guys were able to do and what God was doing in the staff and the church. Thank you guys for being all branch. Thank you guys for being who you are. You are an incredible church. Um, had a just an amazing time connecting with my family, but and more importantly, just got some good coaching time, some good counseling time, and some good time to kind of really work on health and uh, really dig into to my own self so I could be a, um, a stronger and better leader when I get back and um, I'm back. So I'm excited to get into this. Thank you again. You guys are awesome. And by the way, um, we have an amazing worship team, don't we? And uh, we had some great speakers. So we just thank... We had some great speakers, and I bring this up because uh, those of you who are at home, I watched at home, I got to watch all the speakers and see everybody, and uh, you know, it's just not the same. I came back about four weeks ago to sit and worship in second services, and I was crying like a baby. There is just something about being in the presence of God and the presence of his people you just can't beat. And if you have not yet come back to church, you're still sitting at home watching only online, First of all, I want to say hi, thank you for watching, but we want to invite you. We want to see you. I don't, I don't know of any greater experience than to be in the presence of God and his people. So please, I know it's scary. I know there's things out there, but your God is greater than those fears. So we'd love to see you. Otherwise, hello, hello outside. If you're bearing that heat, you're amazing. But we're going to, uh, we're going to dive in. We are in this series called Expedition. We are taking a journey with God in prayer. And uh, the last three weeks, Stephen, Brent, and Justin have done a great job kind of walking us through what this is going to look like and where we're headed. And so before we do anything else, I'd like to pray. Would you join with me? Father, thank you so much for our opportunity to just speak with you. God, thank you for just the amount of service this church has poured forth and, and all the hard work that they were willing to do. And God, the, the things that you did over the summer, we pray that you would now just uh, take all of that work and begin to bear it fruit in the future. Lord, as we get in your word, allow um, our hearts to be open and ready to hear from you as we uh, look and examine this conversation on prayer. So we just, we lay it at your feet. We thank you for this opportunity we have. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. March 10th is a, is a very important date, not just because it was my birthday, that actually doesn't matter, but actually 100 years earlier, uh, and, and roughly, it was uh, in March 10th, 1876, the world absolutely changed. I don't even think we realized how big of a date that was. In a room, it was a laboratory on the East Coast, New Jersey, I believe it was, uh, a man named Mr. Bell stood oh, and a hood was over his head and he's talking into this hood. And you're thinking, this guy, if you were to look at him, you'd thought, this guy is a maniac. He's weird. Why is he talking to his umbrella? This is strange. And he had a little coil bit of wire in there. And, and what you didn't see is that that coil bit of wire stretched off into another room where his um, where his fellow workman, Mr. Watson, Thomas Watson, not Dr. Watson of Sherlock Holmes fame, but his lab assistant is in another room. And as he turns it all on, he starts to talk. He says these words, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to speak to you. That's the first sentence that would ever be transmitted across an electrical wire to be heard as what we would now call a telephone. And Alexander Graham Bell on that March 10th sent that first transmission of a voice over electronic wire. Now, he would later, about a few months later, send it over 10 miles as the first, quote, long distance call. That's kind of funny. And as you begin to think about what happens from there, it explodes to the point where suddenly you have people with phones everywhere. People, you know, rotating a little dial, talking to the, uh, talking to the operator till you and I end up with rotary. Uh, at least my grandma had a good rotary phone. Everybody remember the rotaries? You know, some of you guys are like, what are you talking about? The punch button, and you had to have the big long cord, right? 10 foot long cord, because you needed to talk to your friends everywhere in the house, right? This is telephones we're talking about here. Then suddenly you had the Rome phone, and then you had the cell phone, and now we got the smartphone, and communication transformed overnight. The world was, was totally different after that date. Because now you had this opportunity for this communication with people to hear their voices, not doo -doo 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 -doo, not that kind of stuff, which was how you communicated for years. 
And before that, you wrote letters. And before that, some guy got on a boat to sail it across the ocean to drop it off so it can be read several months later. And when you start to realize that we're on an expedition and how important two-way communication is, Alexander Graham Bell's invention revolutionized expeditions. It enables us now to communicate to people across the space as they go to the moon. This is insane, the kind of stuff that has gone on since that time. And what's interesting is that original invention really was a one way, right? He spoke, Watson heard, and Watson came. And some of us think that's exactly how your prayer life works. That's a one way communication. I talk to God and I say, God, this is what I need. And he kind of wait around. Did he hear me? But that's not how prayer works. And as we move away from now how to talk to God, which um, our, our friends brought us through in the last few weeks, we're going to adjust now and shift to how do you listen to God? Because here's the thing. Prayer is not just about talking. Prayer is also about listening. And I don't know if we always realize that. We, we've grown up to say, this is how you talk to God, and you talk to God this, but prayer is also about listening to God. And when you ask God, you know, your will be done, you're kind of going like, God, I need to know what your will is. Show me what's going on. We want to be a kind of people who listen, not just speak. And so how do you listen to the Lord is, is a great question. How do we engage in this? Because some of us have not been taught that, hey, you can listen to the Lord. And some of us have not been taught how to listen to the Lord. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today in your small groups. You can dive in a little deeper. But let's start here. That if you're going to really communicate and have a two-way conversation with God, yes, you speak and then you listen. But you need to prepare. And the, you prepare to listen to the Lord by paying attention. Right? We have to put ourselves in attention when we listen. Anybody realize attention and listening go together? Right on that one? You agree? Uh, trust me, it's true. Someone with, I'm somebody with ADD, and what's funny is I can be staring you in the eyes, and I have no idea what you're talking about because my mind has gone way over somewhere else. Anybody with me on that one? And suddenly I've had, my wife's like, are you listening to me? Yes, absolutely. No, no, I'm not. I've had to get really honest. No, I stopped listening a few minutes ago because this went here. And it's like... If I don't remember your name, it's because I literally met you, got really nervous and was thinking about my nerves rather than talking and his, listening to your name. And so there's this tension with paying attention and listening. And when it comes to God, he can grab your attention. He did that with Saul of Tarsus. You know, when he took Saul and knocked him on the ground, showed up and said, dude, buddy, stop. You're, you're the one persecuting me and you're done. I'm sending you to the nations. Enjoy the pain. I don't know if I want God to grab my attention. <laughs> I'd rather give my attention to the Lord, amen? And that's what we're gonna talk about. How would you give your attention to the Lord? How do you give it over to him? And, and so we're gonna start here in a small example found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter three. If you've got your Bible, you can open it up to 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, if, if you're new to your Bible, it's in the front half, it's called the Old Testament. Those would be the Hebrew scriptures. And it's gonna be kind of near the beginning of those. And if you're looking at things like uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy, go right. If you see like Kings or the Chronicles, go left. You'll find Samuel. And 1 Samuel chapter 3 is about a young man who was um, kind of born to a woman who can have children. And she, she got this blessing from the high priest. So Samuel comes about and she goes, this is my firstborn. I love him. I want to make sure that he, he grows up in a good place. So he sends him to live in the tabernacle with Eli, the high priest. And so while Samuel is growing up, Eli's not the greatest role model on the planet, but you know, he is the high priest. And so he's living in the actual tent of God, like the tabernacle of God. We kind of pick up with Samuel one night as he's kind of going to bed in chapter three, verse one. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to Yahweh. Now I'm just going to use that word when you see capital L-O-R-D, because that's actually the word we use Lord and, but the original pronunciation would have been Yahweh, that's God's name. So it goes, now the boy Samuel was ministering to Yahweh in the presence of Eli. And the word of, and the word of Yahweh was rare in those days, and, and there was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had, been, had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place, and the lamp of God had begun, not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of Yahweh where the, where the ark of God was. Like, you know that thing in Indiana Jones, right? That thing is sitting and Samuel's sleeping right by it. Like, he's not even a priest. He's like really close. This is a very interesting setup and scenario. So he's living in the presence of God, sleeping in the presence of God. And so Yahweh begins to speak. Then Yahweh called Samuel and Samuel said, here I am. 
And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call. <laughs> Go lie down again. So he went and lay down. You ever have kids who get up? Oh, Daddy, I want a drink of water. Right, that whole thing? And you're like, yeah, it's three in the morning. What are you doing? Go back to bed. And then you give them that, Daddy, I want my teddy bear. Whatever it is. So I think this is what's in the Eli's head. Like Samuel's like, oh, I just, I don't want to go to sleep right now. He's like, just go back. I didn't call you. And so Yahweh called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But he said, I didn't call you, my son. Lie down again. And now Samuel did not yet know Yahweh, and the word of Yahweh had not yet been revealed to him. So he doesn't understand that God speaks. He's never experienced God speaking to him. He hasn't run into God speaking to him, even though he lives in the, in the tabernacle. And Yahweh called Samuel again, verse 8 says, and the third time. And he arose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you've called me. And Eli perceived that Yahweh was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Yahweh, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And Yahweh came and stood, calling at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. And Yahweh tells Samuel a prophecy about the life of Eli and what will go on. What's interesting about this picture is that I believe a lot of us don't realize that God is speaking to us and we just don't realize it's him sometimes. We might think it's our own insight, our own thoughts, our own ideas, whatever, or, or it may be your own, oh, look, I really figured this verse out. But God speaks to us and sometimes we just need to be reminded that, hey, you know what? We need to pay attention. And this morning, what I want to challenge us is to begin. When you get into your prayer times and, you've, and you spend some time in prayer, and you spend some time in the Word, you spend to stop and go, Lord, your servant is listening. What do, you, what do you have to say? To actually enter your prayer time, even with this idea that God could speak to you right away and, and speak to you at church in these kinds of things. What I want you to be able to do is pay attention. But in order to pay attention as Americans, we got to get rid of some distractions. Amen. Like, if you want to listen, it is hard to listen. If I'm sitting in BJ's, I am not listening to you. Just so you know, there are televisions on and glowing, glowing globes of light are very attractive. I'm like a bug, okay? So I just can't help it. You, you, I need a place with less distractions. We all do. To listen to God, what I want to challenge you is, is to be a little bit like Jesus, right? So uh, to be these people who say, speak for your servant listens. But then Jesus is the kind of guy who would withdraw to desolate places to pray. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is God. He's talking to his father. You think he could handle everything, like kids pulling on him and people being healed without his. And he's just like, God, I can sense you now. It's like, no, he's like, you people are all crazy. Time out. I need to get away so I can listen. So I can speak to the Lord. And he would do this. In fact, it, it, would say, it says he would often do this. To get away in desolate place and pray. Now, if Jesus needs to do that, how much more do we with our cell phones and cars and work and people and four children in my life? You know, you need to have some distance. You need to limit the distractions. I want to challenge you then to limit your distractions by trying to find a place to get alone. Some of you are laughing because you're parents of young children. But there are locations. One of those can be a closet. And no, you're not going in there just to cry and scream. You can shut it out. One of it's your car. Many of you understand your commute can become a, a, a holy gym, in a sense, a place where you train and practice as you drive. Praise God for cars with, um, with the ability to have your very telephone connect in because now you don't look like a crazy person talking to God when you're driving in the car. You can talk out loud. You can pull into a parking space and 10 minutes before you do your grocery shopping, take 10 minutes of time with God. You can get alone in our culture. There are places. Now, I would ask that you limit your distractions also, not just by trying to find a place alone, somewhere maybe in an office space, something like that, but also maybe you need to close your eyes if you want. You know, you don't have to to pray, by the way. Some people are like, no, you have to. And that's kind of a Germanic thing. Uh, Jesus raised his hands and his eyes up to heaven when he prayed. And some of us, we need to close our eyes because we're visually distracted. Others of us, we need to open our eyes because God prompts us with what we see. Some of us, we need to put some earplugs in because we're auditorily distracted so we can get some silence. 
Others of you need to turn white noise on so that you can actually focus. There's different ways that you can do this. And I'm not saying that God can't speak over noise, but I'm talking about distractions. One of the most important things that you can do for yourself, and you can check this out. Um, this is modeled by Moses in the book of Exodus chapter 33. If you want to write that down, you got some homework to take a look at this. Moses had a time and a place. He called it the tent of meeting. And he would pitch it outside of the camp. Notice, away from the distractions. And he would set up this tent. And when he would get up in the morning, he would march out. And everybody would stand outside of the tent and watch him go by. Because everybody knew in the morning when Moses goes to the tent of meeting, this is his time with the Lord because the very cloud of, of Yahweh would go and meet him at the tent. He would speak to God as if he was speaking face to face at the tent of meeting. And years ago in a different prayer series, we challenged people, hey, find a place and make it your spiritual location. You know, that was before the movie War Room came out. Have you ever watched that movie? I got my war room. You know, that is an idea coming from scripture where you have a dedicated place that you meet the Lord. And it's a holy place. And you publish to your family and your friends, at this time right now, I'm going to go spend time with God. In other words, leave me alone. That's okay. I had to learn this. Well, I'm still learning this. To publish that I don't just get to go disappear and be with God on my own whimsical time. No, I need to tell everybody in the family, like, hey, guys, I'm going to go spend time with God right now. So that they don't come and interfere. And look, there's a lot of things that we can be interfered for, but that's why I really recommend you take that phone. And if you got to have it for some reason during your prayer time, because you put your notes on it and stuff like that, put it on silent. Make sure that no one can get a hold of you at all. God's big. He can handle the problem for 10 minutes or whatever it is that you're planning on spending time with God and make sure those distractions are minimized. If we're going to hear from God, we want to make sure that we set aside the space and the time that we're paying attention. And we want to start with that simple, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So, okay, how do you hear from God? Like, what does it sound like? Um, you know, again, some of you have been raised in traditions where this is a weird idea. You were raised in a tr Christian tradition where God only speaks to the super saints. Like, you know, all the people who get in, put on stained glass or made into statues and, and put in like Eastern Orthodox churches or, or Catholic churches. So those guys got to hear from God, but not me. Oh, the pastor hears from God. So you got to come ask me and I got to pray for you. No, 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 no. You see, God wants to speak to all of us. I believe the scripture it declares that God is speaking to his people he made in his image because God made everything by his word. He speaks to those who can hear him made in his image. I don't think God stopped talking. But I believe there are three ways that if you're going to listen for the Lord, there are three ways you're going to find him. The first one is the most critical way. And the first one is scripture. We listen to the Lord by scripture. And that's because I believe that every single page not only shouts that God still speaks today, but every single page is God speaking to you. It is the word of God. It is God's voice. In fact, the Bible attests to this so many times. You just do a simple study on the voice of God or the voice of Yahweh and what you're going to run into, the voice of the Lord. It is all kinds of texts like this. Uh, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, by walking in his law. So in this scene, Daniel is praying. He's repenting on behalf of Israel. He was a, a prophet in Babylon in the, in the 5th century, 6th century BC. And he is asking God to forgive them. And notice what he says. He says, we haven't obeyed your voice, which is your law. Now they had the law written down. It was called the Torah. It was the first five books of the Bible. And they knew that, but they saw it as his voice because he literally spoke from the mountain. The Ten Commandments, they wrote it down. They knew it was his voice. The prophets would speak and they would write it down. This was his voice written to us. And this is critical to grasp because when you go into your prayer time, don't go without a Bible. Don't, don't just go like, into your prayer time. Like, and I'm not talking about like when you're praying throughout the day and you're, you're just talking to God as you're going through things, but there should be a time where the Bible is in front of you and you're praying through your Bible, you're praying with your Bible because your Bible will inform your prayer life. And we can hear him speak through those very words of scripture. Some of you are struggling through work problems, marriage problems. Some of you guys are wondering about your kids and what do you do with these guys? Or maybe you're even questioning, should I date this person and you have some questions about that. Did you know the Bible covers all those things? It covers all the aspects, including whether or not you should move out of California, because I know all of you are praying about that right now. <laughs> I'm not, but I know some of you are. So the point is that God is 
got something to say to all of us. And if you'll pick up and read the word of God, it'll save you some time praying about it because he's already told you about it. If you're going, God, should I date this girl? I know she's not a Christian. The answer is no. He already told you, don't be unequally yoked. We don't flirt to convert. (laughs) That's not our calling. And you don't need to ask God what his will is. It's already written down. If you're wondering, God, you know, should I do this or that? You got 10 commandments to give you some really good stuff. And Jesus summed them up pretty easy. Is, would this be loving God? That's the first question you ask. And then you ask, would this be loving others? That's the second question because the first comes, we'll see that as we get in 10 commandments in our next series. But the bottom line is you don't have to ask certain questions because he'll lay it out plainly for you in many places, in the epistles, in the law. There's all these spots that as you learn to read your Bible and as you read your Bible, you're going to learn what God's will is and it's going to save you some time asking him because he's already spoke. On another way though, it does something important as well. See, when God can directly speak to you, uh, in my course, an interpretation, how to study the scriptures and interpret them in their historical context and stuff like that, it's called hermeneutics, weird word. They, they would talk about this idea called significance. And significance has probably happened to all of you who have been a Christian for very long and read your Bible. What happens is you'll be reading through the Bible and suddenly the scriptures leap out at you in such a way as to convict you of a sin or inspire you in a direction. It breaks your heart open. It reminds you of something. You get some instruction. You suddenly feel a calling. This is what significance does. Now, I need to be careful here because you can hear from God directly from the scriptures, but it's going to be in context. God's not going to lift something out and, and, and answer your, your request. That's already clear somewhere else. Let, let me explain. In those same hermeneutics courses, they would say, this is, not signif- this is not what we mean by significance. He, literally, one of the guys was a pastor at a church. It's like, I had a lady years ago come up to me and go, I'm getting a divorce from my husband. And, and he was like, uh, what? Why? You know, what's going on? She's like, yeah, I met this guy at work. He's incredible. And I know God's behind this. He's blessing it. And he was like, uh, no. Well, she's like, yes, I opened the scriptures and I was asking God, God, should I leave my husband, the jerk that he is, and go after this awesome guy and who, who wants to go out with me? And I was reading the Bible and said, put off the old man and put on the new. <laughs> Which, by the way, is about becoming holy in your life from the book of 1 Corinthians um, and Ephesians. And the weirdest thing is that's not how God speaks through the Bible. I'll tell you what, every time he has spoken clearly with a significance that has hit me, it's always contrary to my desires. Crazy as it is. I thought I was doing it. And he's like, no, over here. And I go, oh. Because when God does that, what he is actually doing is this book is not just a book. And if you're new to the Bible and you haven't really read it and you think it's some dusty old tome, some that some, you know, pick up and it's like, oh, that's weird. Yeah, I agree. It can be weird. It can be, it's from a different time. But when you read it, something can occur that begins to happen. That's why I think most people don't is it's like an x-ray machine that starts scanning your soul. In fact, the the author of Hebrews put it in these terms after quoting several different psalms. He goes, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You're not reading it for information. It's reading you. In fact, he, he applies the Bible, the scriptures, so tightly to God. He says, And no creature is hidden from his sight. As if this is God staring into your soul to speak to you. But are all are naked, exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And when you bring the word of God and you open it before, you are looking at the very words of God written down that are there to penetrate our soul from a God who's known every human being throughout history and time, including you, every culture, every place. And he's smart enough to put all that information that would deal with all of our hearts in one location for everybody to find. I can't expand on that, but maybe I'll do that in the Rabbit Trail podcast. But the bottom line is that what you have here is a powerful, powerful act of God 
that if we're listening, it will change you. He's speaking in it. So I have a question. When you came through those doors today, did you come with the heart to say, God, I'm here. I'm listening. Or are you checking a box? It changes the way you come to church when we realize this is a two-way communication. And so in our prayer time, bring that scripture in. Allow it to guide your prayers, but also for the Lord to speak in it because his primary way is through the scriptures. The secondary way that he will speak to us is he'll speak through others. And, and many of you have experienced this as well. I, I know I have. Um, we, we kind of, again, think that only the people that are going to speak are like the pastors and the super saints. And pastors and super saints are not combined, by the way. Uh, they're, they're different peoples. But no, no, no. God wants to speak through everybody who's a Christian. He'll speak through you. How do I know that? Well, because when Peter had the Holy Spirit come upon him and the other apostles and all those disciples that were in the upper room go out to start preaching, he, he says, guys, we're not drunk like you think. Actually, this is a, a prophecy that uh, has come to pass. And it comes from Joel. And he preached and he says this. This is Peter's words. He says, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. It's not talking about in select individuals. It doesn't matter if you're old, you're young. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or you're rich, male or female. He says, no, no, the spirit of God has come. He says, this has been fulfilled. It has now come upon his people. And all of us then can be used as those who speak. And God speaks through. Now, let me explain this a little bit. Sometimes this can come like as what some would say is a word of prophecy. You can go back and check our gift series and how we define all that. Maybe a word of knowledge or something like that. And sometimes this looks like this, where somebody just gets something and, and they're like, I need to say this. Now, I don't actually think if you feel like you got something, that necessarily means that you ha really got something from the Lord. I think it's more about the listener than the speaker. And the reason I say that is because experience upon experience has shown me that I know people who are like, oh, the Lord has told me to tell you this, and they tell me, and I'm just like, and that meant absolutely nothing. One of those events happened to my wife years ago. She was up in Canada with some friends, um, YWAM group that was doing some prayer and worship time, and she had gone up there just to hang out with one of her friends and see Canada. And while they're praying and worshiping in the circle, one of the girls across from her goes, look, I just got this picture in my head and, and looks at the girl next to my wife. And she's like, um, I just feel like God wants me to tell you, like, this picture, I see this tightly bound up, like, ball that's so tight and, and tense and all this stuff is, is just pulling and pulling and you feel all wound up and he wants to release you. He wants to set it free and, get, and breathe into your life some, some freedom again. And the girl goes, Oh, thanks. Just didn't have any attention. Had no problems in her life. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. My wife is sitting next to her going like, I think you missed the chair. She's like, that was for me. She's never forgotten it. But God did indeed shortly after begin to unwind some of the deepest tensions and stuff that were going on in her life. I think sometimes more about the listener Sometimes we can be speaking and we don't even realize we're saying anything that's affecting people. That happens to me almost every Sunday when I preach. I'll go out there and people are like, oh my gosh, that sermon was, was, was the answer. Were you like got cameras in my house or something? No, no, I don't, by the way. I don't, I don't subscribe to any of that kind of stuff. I don't like stalkers. And the bottom line is, no, the, the, the Lord is speaking as you expose the word. It's not about how creative and amazing I can make it. That helps. But some of you have come out and you've said, when you said this, it hit me so hard. That's what God, I've been needing to hear. God so convicted me. I'm going, I don't remember saying that. I'll go through the recording. I don't, what sermon were you listening? Did you have like earbuds in? Because this is not the same sermon. And God will speak through people 
to convict us of our sins, to transform us in our lives, to encourage us. Guess what? This happens when you share Christ. Did you realize that? We love Christ, we pray with him, we live for Christ, we get out there, we serve. But if you're not sharing Christ because you think you're not good enough, because you really don't know the gospel, my mom brought me to Christ because years ago when I was 10, I got baptized, and because I, I kind of want to get baptized as a 10 year old, I was like, hey, I want to give Jesus a birthday present. It was Christmas morning. And I was all excited about it. And yeah, I, I think I had a faith, a child's faith. The night I came in loaded, and my mom looked at me, the, her words were, you're a baptized Christian, Greg. What are you doing? That's not the gospel. But God spoke, and my heart was changed. And I got to church, and I heard the full enfleshment of the gospel indeed, but God spoke through my mom that day, and I was saved. Don't knock how you deliver the gospel. Just share it. He has put his spirit within you. Do the best that you can. And God, if he's going to speak, is going to speak. And it will be heard. Do not stop yourself from sharing. Because he can share through you. Now, we can hear when he did that for us, we can hear it in sermons. We can hear it when he's encouraging us in these kind of cases. We can hear it from the word of God. There's a third way you will hear from God, and that is the, the last way. He'll speak by his spirit. And indeed, God will speak in this manner of this, the spirit of God directly to your heart, to your life. You say, okay, well, where is that in the Bible? Well, Jesus speaks of this on his last night as he's headed to the cross to, or as he's headed to be betrayed in the garden. He is giving his long sermon to his, uh, to his disciples as he's going, and he speaks about the spirit. As he's going about the spirit, he says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now, in this case, this kind of helps us as Christians say, well, look, I, I can believe that the words found in, in the Gospels are indeed Jesus' words. He brought them back to the remembrance of the apostles. They were able to write them down. Awesome, that's the Spirit's work. He, he wrote the Bible. But Jesus doesn't just say that. He goes on to expand it from just he'll teach you all things in the ter terms of just what I've said to you. He goes on to say later in his, in his remarks, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And whatever he declare to you, things that are, are to come. He will glorify me, for he will t take what is mine and declare it to you. So his words coming to you are God's words, because he is God. And he can speak to you directly about the things that you're wrestling with in life. He can speak to you about a business decision. He can give you wisdom. He tells you, if you need wisdom, ask, I will give it to you. He can speak to you about scientific matters. You're like, really? I have read enough of scientists who are Christians how they all have a similar consistency to say, I was wrestling with this problem and I entered into prayer and as I was praying, it seemed that the answer came to me. And then they have this scientific breakthrough. This isn't just about scripture. In fact, Chuck Swindoll was so convinced it was at one time in his life that in one of his books, he had to repent of it because he's like, I just got to say this because I've believed this for too long. He says, for years, I embraced the limited view of this statement, even though Jesus specifically uses the word all. I felt he was referring only to the truth of scripture. If one of the Spirit's tasks is to guide us into and disclose the truth, who says that means only the truth of Scripture? Why couldn't it include the truth of his will or the truth of another person or the truth regarding both sides of a tough question and a decision? I believe that the Spirit of God dwells within you and he will speak to you. What will it sound like? Um, you know, I can point you to a couple of things. We can go back to the Elijah situation that Kent took us through where he's sitting on Mount Sinai and he's seeking God and God comes, right? And he, you suddenly see this mount. He's at the Mount of God and go out, stand before the, on the Mount before the Lord. And behold, Yahweh passed by and there was a great strong wind that tore the mountains and broke it to pieces and rocks before Yahweh. But, the, but Yahweh wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake but he wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but he wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. 
Now, here's what's weird. Once you saw the earth, he's going like a, through a reverse exodus. He, he's leaving the promised land to run through the desert to be fed by God, to go to the mountain of God, where now you've got a reverse Sinai, where you've got all the fire, the wind, and all the stuff. And when all that had happened, God was going to speak the Ten Commandments in a very loud voice. Instead, he gets a whisper. Now, some people want to say, this is the only way you hear it. I think this is a way to hear it, but I think when God speaks personally, he is calling you to an intimate communication to you. It doesn't mean it applies to everybody. It is a whisper, and I like how Mark Batterson puts this. He suggests that God whispers because he wants you to lean in. See, when you whisper something, it's only for them. When you whisper something, it's very intimate. And so in your prayer time, when God wants to tell you something, and it's for you, he'll whisper. And he speaks. Some of you, you'll, you may have dreams. Some of you, you may have visions. I've had visions in my life. They are real. And I may not have heard an audible voice of God, but I guarantee you, I've heard the voice of God enough times. I, I, people go like, well, how do you know? How do you hear it? I hear it in what I call my knower. I, I don't know any other way to put it except a truth suddenly enters my mind that is contrary to all of my other thoughts, that is so clearly not me, and that is so aligned with the scriptures that it brings me a conviction, a comfort, or a direction. Note it will always align with, with the scriptures. And you say, well, how do you know? How do you know it's really God's voice, not somebody else's? And here's the answer to that. I love Scooby-Doo. Any, any Scooby-Doo people out there what, growing up? Right, Shaggy? Ooh, yeah. It's really good, yeah. I love, gee, Scoob, that's good. You know, I just love Scooby-Doo. And I watch a lot of Scooby-Doo. And forgive me, but after I'd watched tons of Scooby-Doo, I got to know one amazingly, really cool band from Britain through Scooby-Doo called the Monkees. Right? And the problem was, I couldn't tell a Monkees song apart from a Beatles song, which is like horrific for many of you. Because of Scooby-Doo. I didn't know what the Beatles were. I only knew what the monkeys were. And I thought everything that was British was the monkeys because I'm nine. But as I've gotten older, I've listened to enough Beatles to know mm, the monkeys and the Beatles are not the same thing. My ear's been tuned to it. Your ear gets tuned as you read the very voice of God on the page as you hear him speak to you over and over and over again in his poetry and his commands and all his ways, when his voice comes to you, it's unmistakable it's him because it is in line with the scriptures. And you're tuned to hear his voice. Now, some of you may be going, well, wait, wait, Greg, I've been a Christian for 40 years. I've never heard his voice. I've never experienced him speaking to me. Like, Really? Why haven't, I, why haven't I had anything like that? I would say some of it may be because you were trained in a, in a time or in a tradition that says you weren't supposed to hear. And so we weren't paying attention. Another angle may be that you were simply somebody who thought that, well, God won't speak to me and you, you didn't try or you name it. But there is one reason for some of us that God's not speaking. And I need, to, I need to end on this because I need us to be, take it pretty seriously. You see, some, for some of us, God is no longer speaking because we didn't obey. So actually the word in the Hebrew and actually in the Greek used often to hear or listen can also be translated obey. And what happens is we can get ourselves in a place where God told you to do something once. He told you to plant a church. He told you, hey, you're going to go be a missionary. He told you, hey, I want you to, to really engage in this evangelism with this friend. Or he wanted you to do that. And you said, nah, I'm not going to do that. Whatever the reason was. And every time you go back to pray with God, it seems like that thing keeps popping up. And eventually you say, nah, no. And we have an illustration of this. His name was King Saul. He was the first king of all of Israel, chosen by God, selected by Samuel himself. He, becomes a, he starts prophesying for God. He hears from God through prophets. He gets all this stuff. And every time God said, I want you to do this, Saul went, hey, do I really got to do that. I want to do like half of that. And he first half obeyed. Then he didn't obey. 
And then he just didn't care. And God said, you're done. Takes the kingdom away, gives it to David, puts a spirit, not a nice spirit, an evil spirit onto, onto Saul. So he's like, no, he can't, he's freaking out. And in the end, ultimately Saul finds himself desperately seeking for God's opinion. And so he winds up going to see a necromancer in this weird location called Endor. It's in the Bible before it was in Star Wars. <laughs> and while he's there, he asks this woman to bring up the spirit of Samuel and she's able to do it. She screams, freaky situation, scariest scene in the Bible. And not because of the situation, but because of what he says. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And then Saul answered, I'm in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me. Scariest line in the scene. And God has turned away from me and answers me no more. There can be a place upon which a God has told you what he longs for and has answered you enough times that we have not listened that he stops speaking. Christians in the room, if you're not hearing from the Lord anymore and you've been longing to, you don't know why, I guarantee you he's ready to tell you. I know that because I'm a dad. And my kids have done something wrong and they're like, dad, can we talk about Minecraft or whatever it is? I'm like, no, no. We need to talk about this before we talk about anything else. And the same thing goes in the house of the Lord. I don't know what it was, but if you've gone to sit in his presence and you're not hearing from him anymore, maybe you just say, God, what was it? Would you remind me? I need to turn, repent, and I need to do it, what you told me to, because I've been too far away. And maybe it's in this next few minutes of silence that you need to do some of that. Maybe it's when you get home and you take your 10 minutes and in your car or whatever it's gonna be. Right now we wanna sit and say, God, speak for your servant is listening. And if you gotta convict me of something, show me so I can change. And maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. This is the first time you've been to a church in a long time or maybe this is something that you're like, hey, uh, you know, I'm interested in talking to God, that's cool. Well, I'm just gonna tell you, God will answer your prayers at first to bring you to him so you can meet him. But I just want you to know when you finally get into his presence, when you finally begin to talk to him, I'm just gonna let you know, if you're not a Christian, it is not a comfortable experience. I'm not gonna tell you that you're gonna have this awesome, magical experience with God because I'm a pastor who sits on airplanes and I'm not a holy guy. But for some reason, when I tell somebody I'm a pastor, they wanna confess their sins and tell me why they haven't married their girlfriend yet and you know, X, Y, and Z. Because when we step in front of what we perceive as something that is good and pure and whatever you wanna think of it, but when you truly step into the presence of God who is pure and good and true and just, and we realize that we're dirty, and we're liars, and we're unjust, and we're broken, it's uncomfortable because God says that we need to talk about something. But don't leave because the day of judgment isn't here. That day of judgment is coming in the future. Today is a day in which God says, well, I wanna talk about this because I wanna point you to something else. You see, yes, I should judge you for all of these things, but what I did instead is I sent my son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, to take all of that punishment, shame, judgment, and death on him. And what I wanna give you is all of his righteousness, purity, goodness, truth, and life instead of judgment today. But you gotta go through the discomfort of seeing the sin first, seeing the shame and acknowledging it before you can move to the grace. See, judgment without grace is called permission and God doesn't do that. Or sorry, grace without judgment is called permission. God doesn't do that. But judgment with grace is called mercy. And he will convict you first so that you will see what he's saving you from. So maybe in this time, when you meet with God, you experience that, then keep going. Receive his son, Jesus, who bore your sins on the cross, who gives you eternal life, who makes you right with God so you can have a relationship with him. So now what we're gonna do is bow our heads and take a minute. 
and just ask the Lord, Lord, will you speak to me? I'm listening.